Welcome to our Wednesday webinar series. This week, we're looking at uh, HR considerations for academic leaders as we head into the next hiring season. And I am joined by Grace Lee, my wonderful friend and colleague who is a partner at Venable and is also the general counsel for the National Business Officers Association, NBOA. Hey, Grace. Hey, Brad. We are thrilled to have you today. And before we start into our conversation, just a few things to remind folks of. Um, I've written a blog about preparing for hiring in 2022. Um, please take a look over there. I'm sure Sienna is gonna put that up into the chat as well. Our call for teachers at One Schoolhouse is going on right now. If you know a fantastic independent school teacher who's looking for a new challenge um, and interested in online education, send them our way. We also want to note that this is the last webinar of 2021. We'll see you next on January 12th uh, in the new year. Uh, and Sarah and Liz at that time will be talking about resilience. And this week in our newsletter, we asked you, as an academic leader, what are your top concerns heading into the 22 hiring season? And here's what you've said so far. Worried, folks are worried in, about competitive salary and benefits. Uh, folks are also worried about curricular and extracurricular needs, diversity and equity in our hiring process, late notice of faculty departures. Grace, I know that's something you and I saw a lot this year and actually are continuing to still see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A shortage of really good candidates. Uh, and then also retention of current faculty. I was actually hoping to see that much higher, honestly, than 40 3%. I think that that's a real area that academic leaders can be focusing on as we get into uh, as we get into the new year. Um, Grace, we're going to jump into a couple of questions, but two more quick housekeeping things for folks. One, if you'd like to turn on closed captioning, you can go ahead and do so by clicking the CC button in the bottom of the screen. And then two, if you have questions for Grace today, and we hope you do, make sure to put them in the Q&A feature of the webinar. For um, Zoom webinars, we use the Q&A features, not the chat to ask questions. And I know I'm gonna say this before Grace does remember that any uh, advice that, legal, that, that Grace gives today or any answers that Grace gives today does not constitute legal advice for you. Grace, you probably even have a better disclaimer on that, right? That'll do just fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, goodness. Okay, Grace. So I'm going to jump into a couple of questions. And again, we'll take some questions from other folks as well. Um, before we talk specifically about hiring in 2022, let's talk about things that academic leaders should be prepared for or should prepare for um, in what promises to just be a busy hiring season. So what are some of those things that academic leaders should be thinking about right now as they prepare? Sure. Well, Brad, I think you, you know, as as always, you've got the finger on the pulse and you've already highlighted some of the um, key sort of things that we are seeing right now. I mean, I don't even know if we can call it a hiring season anymore. It just seems like people are hiring now year round because um, we are just seeing a lot of people leave unexpectedly, even mid year um, or um, signing documents saying that they're going to come back next year. And then, you know, a few months later, but they're still interviewing for other jobs. And then a few months later, they say, oh, by the way, I found another job and I'm moving to another state. So um, there's just uh, a lot more uh, fluidity, I would say, um, in the culture and the mentality. Um, and I think that hiring managers need to sort of have that in mind in terms of what's going on in our our environment. There's just a tight market, as we all know. And so um, for hiring managers, you know, really being clear on what what you're looking for, um, what the job is, and acting quickly to make the offer if that's what you're going to do. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of turn around those documents really fast is, is going to be key. But I will say, don't do that at the expense of your due diligence. Um, we have seen a couple of situations where um, a school really needed just to make a last minute hire and by the way, they forgot to do the reference checks. Um, you know, so, and, and I see how it happens. We're all so busy and, um, you know, we really just need to fill the seat. Um, but 
that individual turned out to be not such a good fit for the school. And, oh, well, let's look at what we did during the hiring process. Oh, well, I can't find the notes from the reference check. Maybe we didn't do it. Um, so, you know, making sure that we are taking at least the time to do a thorough interview, do the reference checks, document what you find, um, not skipping those crucial steps. The last thing I will say is, you know, you're, you may get questions and you, you may want to be prepared um, to tell folks what your school's policy is or is going to be regarding vaccinations mm. um, and sort of having um, a clear sense of that as a school administration will be really important. Um, in terms of what we are going to say so that we're setting the expectation, right? The last thing we want is for um, someone to come in and say, well, you never told me and now I feel blindsided and now it's not gonna work. Wow, so that, that's a lot to unpack there, Grace. Actually, let's let's go back to a few of these things. So, <laughs> so, so one is you really should be deciding what your vaccination policy is going to be for 22, 23 really soon probably yes. both for your families before they start signing any contracts, re-enrollment contracts, um, mm -hmm. in order to make sure that they know what the lay of the land is, but then also heading into this hiring process. So yeah. that, that's the decision that probably has to happen in the next couple of weeks for schools, yes? If they haven't made Ideal it already. Ideally, yes. You know, yeah. the, the, the way to avoid um, confusion, um, hurt feelings, and potentially lawsuits down the road is to be clear about the expectations up front so that people can't later say I was misled or you didn't tell me. And to be able to have documentation or language in your enrollment contract, in your employment offer letters. I mean, we're just putting it right in there. You yeah. know, as you know, as a condition of employment, you have to um, comply with our policy regarding vaccinations and other health and safety policies. And you don't have to put the policy in the letter. Yep. Um, you can have a separate policy, but you do want to have a reference to that so that um, it's it's got some teeth, right? Yep. Um, and that we're, we're able to enforce it. The other thing going a little bit back into what you said a second ago was academic leaders really need to know exactly what their school hiring process is, be able to follow that, very clearly and directly, including making sure that we're not skipping steps. But then the third thing that you kind of embedded in there was, and you probably be, got to be a little bit faster with that hiring process than you were previously if you want to get the candidates, um, uh, if you want to get top candidates to your school. I think that's just sort of the reality of the situation right now. Um, a lot of people are competing for, you know, the same candidates and um, you don't want to lose someone just because you weren't able to, you know, move fast enough. So having a clear process, knowing who the decision makers are, you know, doing some of that work up front will definitely help you to um, move through that process with each individual, hopefully more swiftly. So one thing that I know is also on academic leaders plates, uh, right coming back from a holiday break is understanding where their current faculty or current reports are in terms of their intentions to stay or leave. Is there anything that folks should be concerned about or thinking about as they enter into those conversations? Sure, a couple of things. Um, it, it's so interesting. I mean, I think this is, you know, again, I just had this conversation. Um, you know, what can we do to make people stand by their word that if we, you know, a lot of schools use this letter of intent, right? And we, um, ask them to say, oh, I intend to return next year. We're asking them in like February. Um, and, you know, life happens and sometimes people can't stick to that. But then sometimes people just keep their options open and they're like, oh yeah, I signed that, but oh, it doesn't mean anything. Um, and so, you know, it's always the question of like, how do we incentivize people to actually do what they say they were gonna do so that we're not looking in June for a replacement? Um, and is there any language that we can put in this document? And, you know, sometimes we put in language, like if you don't give us enough notice and whatever that meta notice may vary, you know, you won't get it. We will, we reserve the right to withhold a, to not give you a reference letter or mm -hmm. you won't be eligible for rehire or, um, some penalty, like, you know, you'll have to pay a certain amount towards um, a recruiting fee for us to find someone else, which is hard to 
enforce. Um, at the end of the day, if someone decides to leave, we probably don't want them to stay. Right. Um, and um, there's not a lot that we can do to enforce, you know, sort of this, oh, but you promised. Um, I would be careful too about, you know, I, I know sometimes, especially in smaller communities, there's these wink, wink, nod, nod agreements between schools, like I won't poach your people and you won't poach mine and, you know, let's get through the year. And um, those types of agreements are really heavily being scrutinized by the Department of Justice as antitrust violations. Um, there be there's more and more cases every day. So I would be very careful about, um, and the key is not entering into some sort of implied or explicit agreement with another school where we're not gonna, we agree that we won't hire each other's employees um, and, and removing those market opportunities. Hmm. Already given us a lot to think about here. And folks, again, if you have questions for Grace, make sure to put them into the Q&A. We will make sure to save some time for your questions. While we're waiting for questions, Grace, I don't know, are there other kind of do's and don'ts that academic leaders should keep in mind um, during the hiring process? Well, you know, there's always my, I always have my like, before you go into a hiring process, make sure that anybody who's coming into contact with that um, individual, with that applicant understands the, the, the questions that they can and cannot ask during the interview process. Um, you know, don't ask things that are going to focus on someone's protected category that could later lead to a claim of discrimination. Um, you know, you might, it, I feel that there's a lot more conversation these days about potential disabilities, um, especially if a vaccination conversation comes up either from the applicant or from the hiring manager. And someone might say, oh, well, I can't get the vaccine because of my disability XYZ. And now we know that information during the hiring process. And that's not really something that we necessarily wanted to know during the process. And so I think to be, um, you know, sort of just mindful of how to have those conversations and just say, you know, we, we require the vaccine subject to um, certain exemptions that we can talk about later, or you can talk about with HR. Um, uh, yeah, and, and you know, if you have 20 minutes to sit down with anyone who's gonna interview someone to just do the, you know, the quick top 20 do's and don'ts <laughs> in terms of questions that they should or should not ask um, an applicant, that, that would make me very happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, mean, I know that a number of schools too are, Grace, going to, for, for reasons to try to make sure that they have more equity and inclusion in their hiring process, that you're asking the same questions to candidates across the board. You're not just willy-nilly going into interviews anymore yeah. uh, with what might just be top of mind for that person. Yeah, you can't, yeah, you have to move away from the, you know, sort of cocktail hour chit chat, you know, let's just, let, you've got to plan it out. You've got to have some interview questions ahead of time. You've got to tell your hiring managers or interviewers what you're looking for, um, get them to fill out some sort of evaluation email or summary afterwards. So you've got some documentation there. Um, you know, some schools will go, uh, uh, you know, really plan ahead. And, and if someone's going to be there for a day, you know, they'll make sure that certain topics are covered in the morning and other topics are covered in the afternoon so that we're not just like going over the same ground over and over again. Um, so there's lots of ways that you can maximize the process, um, both for you to get the most information that you can, but also for the candidate to get a really good sense of who you are as a school, what your priorities are, what the position entails. Um, the more you can sort of make those um, intentions clear up front, the, the better hiring decision you're gonna make um, and, and, and the better the fit will be. You know, I think that there are times when um, people ask questions that are seemingly innocuous, like, oh, well, it looks like you're gonna have to move. Does your um, husband wanna move too? Or, you know, but maybe they don't have a husband. Maybe they should have a spouse or a significant other and you shouldn't make assumptions like that. And 
you know, sometimes people just aren't thinking about that when they're when they're interviewing. So giving a little bit of that heads up, having some questions planned ahead will help you to be consistent and to avoid some of those pitfalls. You know, another thing, uh, Grace, that you and I have talked about before is a way to make sure that um, uh, uh, that there's consistency across the entire organization uh, in job interviews uh, and, and understanding who the right candidate might be is for academic leaders to really look at job descriptions right now. Um, can you talk about the importance of that for a second and the importance too of just making sure that the job description uh, is not assuming things. We've mm -hmm. talked before, for example, lots of schools will post, let's say a ninth grade English position, but not talk about all the other things that the teacher needs to be doing other than teaching ninth grade English. Sure, yeah, this is the perfect, wonder, most wonderful time to update those job descriptions. If you haven't done it, I know it's everyone's favorite thing to do. Um, right over winter break. <laughs> um, but no, it, it is truly a key document. So important to have an updated job description that is um, detailed, you know, that tells someone what their job responsibilities are, both inside the classroom and outside the classroom. Are there, you know, obligations to do a club or to come before or stay after or expectations to go to events on the weekends. Let's put that in the job description. Is there a travel requirement? Um, let's say someone has to go out and, you know, be out in the, you know, with alumni community. Is that part of that job? And this becomes important not only to sort of set expectations and to be fair to someone about what they're walking into, but you know, if someone stops meeting those expectations, well, you know, the first thing we hear is, well, tell me where it says that I had to do carpool. Yeah. I'm, I'm a great teacher. I, I don't want to do carpool. It's not, you know, what I signed up to do. Um, so that's why that job description becomes that documentation of, well, it, it's in the job description. Um, the other way that it comes into play is, you know, I want to be able to work from home because I think that the variant is scary and I don't, you know, I have young kids at home who are too young to be vaccinated. Well, the job description requires you to be on campus um, and we are not allowing people to work from home and, you know, drawing those boundaries and putting up those guardrails in the job description is more important than ever. Um, we're just seeing a lot of challenges. Um, um, both to, you know, where people work and how much they work and, and who does what, so. Yeah, and, and Grace, this, this seems to, um, I, you're alluding to something that my guess is that there are other things in the same place. We wouldn't have necessarily thought to put into a job description a couple of years ago, you need to be on campus every day in order to be a ninth grade English teacher, to continue to use that example. Um, are there other things that COVID has changed or kind of brought to light for us um, differently? Yeah, I mean, right. So where your where your work location is is now going into the job description. It's also going right into that employment document, that employment letter or contract, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, things like building in flexibility, we might need to go to an all remote environment again, or we might need you to um, make up time at the end of the year if the government shuts us down for some reason. Yeah. I mean, those force majeure things that um, we talked a lot about over the past year. Um, and, you know, just, just asking people to sort of do those other duties as assigned um, and being upfront about it. Because I think, you know, with COVID, there's just a lot of times where you've got people out, people are quarantining and, or we're just shorthanded. We have, we can't hire enough people, right? So um, just making sure that everyone understands that it's all hands on deck, you know, and you might be the CFO and have to stand outside and, um, you know, do afternoon carpool one day. Well, I know CFOs sort of wear so many hats. But um, you know that's that's a lot of what we're seeing. The other thing I would say is um, I know a lot of interviews are going on virtually, mm -hmm. and um, that can be great. And especially if you have sort of trained interviewers with really good questions that you know you're really digging down. Um, but sometimes things get missed when it's a virtual interview as opposed to an in-person interview. So if you have the option, I would recommend doing in-person. Um, as opposed to virtual, 
if you can. If you can't, just make sure that, again, you've got that good plan going in to the interview so that you've got your questions ahead of time and you're, you're making sure you're asking the right things. And I always, always suggest asking those two questions. Is this person eligible for rehire? And do you have any concerns with this person working with minors? Um, and those are really just yes and no questions that um, even, you know, schools that are very much of the mindset of we don't want to say anything that might get us in trouble and defamation, a lot of times they'll at least answer those one of one of those two questions. Mm, interesting. Hmm. Well, uh, again, folks, if you have any questions, we've got just a couple minutes left with Grace, but if you have any questions, make sure to put them in the Q&A. Grace, I'm wondering why you said uh, it's helpful to bring them on campus if that's a possibility. What are some of the things, if you can share, that schools may or may not miss if they're on campus? I mean, it's it's not crucial, right? But I, I think you can get so much from a virtual interview. But um, sometimes, you know, you might miss that someone is sort of a um, like a close talker or um, kind of really handsy and and you know crosses boundaries quite a bit, physical boundaries. Um, things like that sometimes get missed, um, and and they might have the, the best qualifications and all of that, but those types of behaviors could become problematic um, if not taken in the right context and all of that. So um, yeah, those are some of the things that we've seen, but obviously, you know, with the um, national sort of searches that we do for these positions, I know, and, and certainly Zoom is better than a phone call. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it's not always possible to bring someone on campus and do an, do an in-person interview, especially if they're primarily going to be teaching online anyway. <laughs> um, so it's not, it's not crucial, but that's something to think about. If you were in the shoes of one of these academic leaders who's listening into this webinar today, um, what types of questions might you ask your school's attorney? What are some of the things that you might be thinking about? Oh, gosh, I... I, I always love when academic leaders ask me these types of questions, or I know a school is really on it when they can, when they can talk with me about. Um, you know, I think if they will, you know, when they start asking questions about what's a really good background check process, um, what's a really good reference check process? What are the questions that we should be asking? How should we document it? Um, is there, you know, to the extent that they're building um, processes and consistency and opportunities for documentation, those are the things that will really um, help you get the most out of the process as a decision maker. Um, yeah. And but they'll also make your lawyer really happy in case you get a challenge and you end up having to defend your decision. Um, those documents and those um, those questions that you looked at beforehand and you weren't just sort of shooting from the hip. I mean, those will go a long way. Um, you know, I think that DEI is, you know, we haven't really touched too much on that, but it's a huge um, area of focus right now in terms of both recruitment and hiring. Um, and, you know, I get questions a lot, like how much can we consider the DEI factors over other factors? We, we want to, um, it's part of our mission, it's part of our strategic initiative, but we also don't want to get into trouble with like reverse discrimination or um, other types of claims. So um, again, just sort of thinking through what's, what's a good way to increase our pool of candidates and, and reach people from different areas of life, I think goes a long way in that DEI initiative. Well, and probably being also super explicit in the job description too, around what qualifications one needs to have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some schools are putting it right in the job description or in the employment letter that as a member of our community, you have to support our efforts to be an inclusive and diverse um, environment and respectful and professional and all that stuff. Yep, that's something we certainly do and put it right into the competencies that a candidate, successful candidate needs to have. 
That's great. Well, thank you, Grace, so much, as always, for taking some time to uh, to join us on this webinar. I know that folks will feel better prepared heading into the hiring process, having learned from you over the last half hour. Thank you so much for having me.